Hi, I've designed a complete set of underwear for Adelina, and there's a lot, she's got a lot. Um, in this period, uh, women were obviously um, wearing corsets and chemises and petticoats, but this was before the period of the hoop. Uh, women relied on a lot of starched and stiffened um, undergarments to give that proper bell-like shape of this time. So the underwear kit actually is comprised of a couple of things and in order of how she will wear, how she's wearing them, she would wear a, um, a split uh, pair of pantalettes and they're tucked and trimmed with a cotton lace. She would wear a chemise and as you can see here, the chemise is worn very low on the shoulders because there's a lot of low uh, decolletage and low necklines in this period. Um, it looks like it's a big garment, but it all gets brought in by the next piece of undergarment, which is her corset. And this corset is made of this really lovely ribbed um, cotton, and it's going to have a busk going down uh, the middle. In reality, it probably would have a lot of uh, whalebone or boning in it, but she's so small and she has such a curvaceous figure already, she doesn't need that much support. And then it's also going to be laced up the back and you'll have all the materials to create this, um, this garment. And then, as I said, uh, this was before the period of the hoop. And the hoop really liberated women because prior to the hoop, when it came in, uh, in the 1850s, late 1850s, um, women had to wear a lot of uh, very heavily starched um, petticoats in order to create that bell-like shape of the 1840s. And she's going to have what we were calling a crinoline. Um, in this case, it's going to have a tarlatan hem, a little bit of uh, synthetic horsehair banding that will be used inside, and, um, and this uh, organdy, which gives it a beautiful body. And then over that, a, an actual woman of the period might have had, you know, three or four petticoats of different styles and, um, and different levels of stiffening to, again, to create that silhouette. So just imagine uh, walking about with so many layers of under things and, um, and heavy fabrics and tight sleeves. This must have been, uh, I know that's all they really knew, but when the hoop came in, it must have been extremely liberating. Um, for women to be able to have some movement and some ease of, of walking and a little bit of circulation. So I hope that you enjoy the underwear kit. Um, it was a lot of fun to put together. Uh, you, as you can see, she's, she's got all of it on right now and it does create that sort of that bell-like shape of this time period um, before the, the actual hoop came into popularity. Well, have fun and I hope you enjoy it. We're starting the chemise, and we start the chemise with the chemise yoke. Uh, you're going to cut two back yokes and two front yokes. And our first step is going to be to sew both of these pairs together at the shoulder seams. And there is no, there is no opening, there's no placket on this yoke. It just slips over her shoulders and it's meant to sit really low on her, around her, um, her bust. So we're, let me just make sure that we got two. Yeah, that's right. You wanna make sure that you've got a mirrored set. So um, basically, your, one of these is going to be your lining and one of them is going to be the front uh, or the outside layer. So we're going to do this. I'm just gonna do that with a one eighth inch seam. And then we're going to press open the seam allowances. So when we're done, you should have a matching pair. Let me just make sure I've got this right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, you should have a matching pair of, um, of yokes. And our next step after that will be, after we've sewn these at the shoulders and pressed open our seam allowances is to match the shoulder seams and to sew with a 1 8 inch seam allowance all around the neckline opening and then we're going to clip into the corners so just make sure that when you're doing that 
that you're very careful about clipping into your corners and that you don't go into your stitching, but we want to basically create this sort of like uh, bound or like contained neckline so you don't have to do any finishing there, it's already finished. So we're going to, um, we're going to step away and we're going to do that and I will come back and show you the next step for this simple garment. Our front and back yokes are together. At this point, the lining and the outside are identical, so just choose which one you want to be the out outer facing. And then you're going to gather up, you're gonna repeat this for both the front, and we're doing the front now, and the back uh, body, but you're gonna gather this up to fit that bottom of the yoke. And then what I like to do is once I've distributed sort of my gathers, I like to give it a little bit of a press just so it's easier to sew. You have a nice flat um, surface to work with. And then we're going to only with the outer layer, so the outer facing layer, we're going to seam these right side to right side together, but only at the outer layer. You want this, <clears throat> you want this lining la layer to uh, remain loose because in our next step, we're going to be turning the lining in and covering this raw edge. You're gonna see this repeated in the pantalette waistband and other types of waistbands and such. So, you know, you just match your ends. And uh, one thing I didn't fail to mention is that this is a very, um, I put it this phrase a lot you can already see it fraying so I would say just do your best not to over handle these pieces um, you just want to make sure that you sew them up and get them pressed you're not really doing any overcasting with the exception of the uh, under or the, the sleeve seam for the um, when you insert the sleeves so basically that's going to be, you can't really see it because of the pins, but that's going to be your front. And once you've done that, once you've sewn that together, you're going to press the seam allowance up towards the yoke. And then, and I'll show this to you in, a, in the next segment, we're going to press in, this is the lining now, we're going to press in that one eighth of inch seam allowance all the way across that long uh, bottom edge and we're going to bring it to cover the inside of this seam so you'll see what that what that looks like when I come back but basically you're going to be doing this for both the line the exterior the front and the back and you're going to be treating them almost exactly in the same way they're just the back's going to be a little bit narrower in terms of the gather so let me go and do that and show you what that looks like. So this is our outside of our chemise, the front outside. Uh, we've sewn the gathered front to the only to the outside yoke. And then we've turned under the seam allowance on the inside yoke. And we basically have pressed it and pinned it in place. So really the, the idea is that this is meant to cover that inside seam. We're going to uh, slip stitch that with very small stitches all the way across, just close it, and then we're going to repeat the same thing for the, the back, where we're going to, <coughs> excuse me, the back and the front pieces are identical. We're going to gather the top of this to fit the back. We're going to seam it to the um, outside layer only, then we're going to turn under the seam allowance on the inside layer and slip stitch that in place. And then basically the body is pretty much done. I just want to um, show you quickly, if I can find it, how we're going to prepare the sleeves. Now where are those sleeves? Here we go. Okay, so it's a very simple sleeve. It's just a little cap sleeve. There's no gathering at the, the cuff, but what we do want to do is we want to do a very narrow hem. Let me just move so you can see this. Very, very narrow hem at the bottom. And, you know, you could roll it. You could do a faux, uh, a faux rolled hem. 
um, really however you want to finish it, but you just want it to be small. So, you know, you could do it with um, a running stitch, which I think would be appropriate. Uh, I like to do just a hem stitch, which is basically just a slip stitch, but I'm going to just do this little, press this down. We're going to do this on each sleeve, and that's identical. There's no uh, front or back to the sleeve, just the top and the bottom. So we're going to do that. We're going to um, hem both of them and put them aside. We can see the next step. So we've done uh, a very simple straight running hem stitch along the bottom of our sleeve. And then for the sleeve cap within the seam allowance, we have uh, run a easing stitch. I mean, it's pretty much a gathering stitch, but it's just for easing. Uh, what we're going to do now, and you're going to notice that the, at this period, the shoulder seam wasn't always directly in the center of the shoulder. It was kind of set back a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about this is the center and this shoulder seam is a little farther back so we're going to just align our centers and centers here I just want to distribute this evenly and we're going to pin it together to our sleeve opening you can see it's not really going to give you very much you know um, uh, fullness here it's just really to help you around the curve and you probably you know you might not even really need to pull it that much just a teeny tiny bit just to give it a little bit of easing into that opening and um, as always I like to start with the the center and the shoulders just make sure that I have enough here. Yeah, it's going to be fine. Okay. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sew this together with an eighth inch seam allowance. I'm going to just neaten up my seam and then I'm going to overcast it. And we're going to be sewing the uh, the sleeves, underarms, and the long seam of the chemise all in one seam. And we're going to do that with a French seam. So I'll show you um, that as a next step, but our chemise is almost done. We're closing up the side seams of the chemise with the French seam. And a French seam was used in underclothes um, pretty consistently throughout the 19th century because of the strength that it would provide. Um, and the chemise would be washed very frequently because it was the one thing that was the closest to the skin. So I'm just closing these up. And basically, a French seam is... When you take the the fabric and you actually it's probably bad to show you already finished seam but let's say this is the right side this is the right side so instead of putting the right sides together you put the wrong sides together you stitch and you generally try to be quite close to the raw edge then you trim that seam you turn it inside out so now you're working right sides together and you're enclosing that first seam in the second seam that you're doing. And I think the trick here is just to do small stitches. Obviously, if this was for someone who's actively wearing it, you probably want to really make it nice and strong, but you just really want to have a good, um, a good seam. So when we're done with that, we're going to turn the hem up by approximately an eighth of an inch. And then we're going to move it up half an inch. Let me just see, my dog is making noise again. Yeah, an eighth and then a half inch. And 
That can just be a top stitch hem if you want. It could be a blind stitch, whatever you want it to be. The one thing about um, chemises is that I don't think really at this time they were very, uh, they were trimmed. So they wouldn't really have like lace on them or anything else. Um, they might if they were, let's say, for some sort of ceremonial occasion, like a wedding or um etc. But I think that you, if you want to add some embellishment to it, what would be appropriate um, might be sort of white work, white embroidery. Um, you can do that on the, the yoke. But I think that this, again, this garment was meant to be closest to the skin and the majority, <laughs> or pretty much no one except for um, the maid or, you know, the, the husband was going to see that garment. So I'm going to continue to close this up. And we will be back when this is when this is complete, and we'll show it to you on Adelina, just so you can see the fit. Here, the chemise is all done. As you can see, it's pretty full, but all that fullness is going to be taken in when the corset gets put on her. Um, as I said, it's very low cut. All you have to really do is, when you're putting it on, just have her arms up and just slip it on from the top and it's gonna stay right at the shoulders, right below the shoulders. And I think when the corset's on, you can probably even adjust it, pull it down a little bit. So she really, you, she really wants to have like that much uh, bosom exposed for let's say her, her evening gown and other things. So, um, that's that's the chemise, very, very simple. And as we talked about, you can add a little bit of white work here, but really at this period, not any lace or, or anything else in terms of embellishment. Great. We'll move on to the next item. We're starting Adelina's corset. It looks complicated, but it's not really. It's just there are some pieces that need to go together. So look for the dots on the pattern, and you're going to see that that's where you match things up. Um, where they're not dots, it's just a side seam that has to be matched. And that's pretty much it. Um, what I do want to show you is that this pattern, or rather this project, is going to be made up of three different materials. The first is going to be that ribbed cotton that's in your kit. And when you're cutting this out, make sure that you're running, um, you're cutting out your right side on the side that has the ribs on it or the lines. You don't want to do it on, well, you know, you could do it on the other side. I think that looks nice too, but really it's meant to sort of look like, I think a fabric that was called coutil. I probably am maybe mispronouncing that, but it was a fabric that was used for corsets uh, in the 19th century, and this sort of has that feeling. And then you're going to have a piece, pieces that you're gonna be cutting out of this tarlatan, this crinoline material, and you're going to have pieces that you're cutting out of this glazed cotton, which is this really pretty um, cotton. This was a very popular lining in the 19th century. Uh, one thing that I do want to say is that you're going to be sewing your cream cotton pieces together as a separate piece, but you're going to be working your crinoline or tarlatan pieces um, together. So what I mean by that is if you sort of were to peel these apart, you'd have a polished cotton piece on top of a crinoline or tarlatan piece. And I think the um, important thing when you're doing this is just to make sure that you're, you're doing right sides of your polished cotton together and that your tarlatan is sort of like your inside lining because that's what it's going to really act as. Um, as I've been sewing these, and I've been sewing these by hand because um, as the instructions say, the sewing machine did not come into uh, wide use until sort of the mid 1850s. And even then it was probably a little bit of a luxury item. Um, I've been sewing these with a, uh, a back stitch, and you're going to see a little bit of the, you know, this isn't really going to pull very tightly, I would say, but it is going to be um, 
it is going to be a sturdy seam when you do a back stitch. Um, I think if this was really being pulled in, we'd want to do this with a back stitch, uh, just normally with a, a back stitch. So um, I'm about to sew the side panel together, and then we're going to sew um, our side seams. We're going to press out all of those seams. All these seams are being pressed open. And then I will show you the next step. But um, imagine this is sort of like, again, this is your lining, this is your interlayer, and this is your outer layer. You're going to have three different layers. Um, there's also something in the 19th century, I think probably even the 18th century, that they used to use in corsets called a busk. And a busk was basically a flat piece of, sometimes it was whalebone, sometimes it was wood, um, sometimes it was decorated, sometimes it was, you know, a scrimshaw that was carved um, by a sailor for his sweetheart. But um, there would be bones in these corsets. Now, because she's so small, we're not going to be doing bones. We're just going to do one busk on the center front of this. And this is, I think this material is called Rigoline. Um, you're going to get a strip of it. You just need to round the top of the Rigoline and the bottom of it. And then what I'd like you to do is just position it on the front. And this will be shown on your pattern piece, just for reference, by this gray shadow line. You're going to want to position this, and I'm using a Frixion pen so that can always be ironed out, because what we're going to do um, and one of our later steps is we're going to sew a channel and that busk is going to slip in before we bind the top of this corset. The busk is going to slip in and it's going to sit there in that channel and it's going to give her a little bit more support. Um, again, these corsets would have been fully boned, but we're just going to do this one just to give her a little bit of that upright um, 1840s um, straight laced uh, silhouette. So I will go and I will do the side seams as I said. I'll come back when we're ready for our next step, which is going to be to actually attach this right sides together. Oh, yep, right sides together. Um, only on the straight uh, back edges. And then we're going to turn it inside out so we actually will have a really clean, strong um, back seam there. And then I'll show you what we do from there. So we've sewn the front of the corset together with the lining of the corset just at the back openings. And this is going to give you a really nice, strong um, seam. So you can sort of see it's taking shape already, which is always fun to see. And what we're going to do now is we are going to pin this together. Now, you can pin this together or you can baste it. It's really up to you, but just note that you're going to need to leave a portion of the bottom open so you can slip in the busk once you've done your top stitching here by hand. So I'm just going to pin this together. Let's see here. You know, and if you're like, a, you know, these are different fabrics. If you're a little bit off, it doesn't really matter in terms of your, your seams, but you can sort of, you can try your best to match your, um, your inner and your outer seams. You know, it might have shifted a little bit. We're working with a one eighth inch um, seam allowance, so it's a little bit tight. Yeah, I think that's going to be fine. So, I don't know. It might be better. It might be better to baste it. And the reason why I say that is that I don't like having my work caught up in pins um, when I'm working. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pin this together and then I'm going to baste it along the top and the bottom edge. But at the bottom, I'm going to leave it open from approximately here to here. And that's what I'm going, well, I'll be able to insert the busk that we've already prepared. And then I can move on to uh, closing that up with another um, line of top stitching below that the busk. So I'm going to do that. 
I'm going to get this basted and then I'm going to come back and show you how we top stitch. So I've decided, rather than doing the busk first, because we want this to be as flexible as possible as we're working with it, I'm going to do the busk last, the busk pocket, but I just want to show you, this really isn't a true top stitch, this is more of a, a running stitch. So what you're doing is you're basically just catching up the back fabric and your lining and your outer fabric together. Of course, I've got a knot here. They say it always happens as soon as you start sewing. There we go. So we're just doing a little running stitch on either side of each one of these seams. You're not going to do the back edge opening because that's where you're going to be doing your eyelets and that's probably enough, um, enough support. But I would say you're gonna want to use a fairly long needle for this because you want to make sure you're going through all those layers and thank goodness for the handy dandy thread uh, clover threader so I'm just going to continue to do this and you you are going to see these stitches on the other side and that's actually kind of I think the charm of it um, you know it would have been hand stitched in the 1840s and they would have seen stitching on the inside. They did a whole like series of um, sometimes very complicated um, sort of top stitching where they would, you know, they would have like a V and then another V um, or they would do it in then diagonals. And I think all of that was really just to give it maybe some decoration, but also some strength, um, you know, these women were being laced into incredibly uh, tight um, corsets. I mean, I think even tighter than an 1860s standpoint. Um, I sort of think of this as like a, a little bit of a torturous period for women with these tight sleeves and, um, and tight long bodices and pointed waists, waistlines. Um, we're just going to keep doing this. I'm not going to bore you with the entire... stitching but you do need a nice a nice sharp needle nice long needle because if you're going through several layers here and you're actually going through your your seam allowances too so just make sure you use a really nice sharp needle and I'll also just show you I had basted along the edge here um, I just basically skipped the inside, the the um, the bottom, and left that open for the bus when we're ready to insert that. So I'm just going to keep going around, and then um, you know when you're going on either side of these seams with your little running stitch, I would basically just go up one side. Don't even bother breaking your thread. Just come down the other side. It's going to make it much faster for you. Um, you know, you can do really however you want, but this is just a little bit of a, of a, maybe a time saver. So I'm going to continue doing this. And when we're ready to, ready to insert the busk, I'm going to um, do my running stitch around the busk line. And then I'm going to leave this open and I'm going to slip the busk in. And I think in this case, I want to slip it in underneath the um, the tarlatan. So it's between the tarlatan and the lining. And you're gonna see that this has a slight curve to it. You're gonna want that curve to work for you. So I would have the curve kind of, if think about the curve of her waist going in, that's the direction you want this to go in. You want it to have that little bit of a, of a curve to it. So it gives it a little bit more shape. So I will continue this and then come back when I'm ready to insert that busk. We've top stitched on both sides of all of our seams with the exception of the back seam. And 
I'm about to insert the busk, but before I do, once you've um, done your top stitching, just press it a little bit. It'll help the seam to lay a little flatter. So in terms of the busk, remember uh, we talked about sort of the inherent curve that this Rigeline or whatever the product name is, has. Um, you just want to make sure that that's sort of facing up, that curve is facing up. So I'm going to slip this in between our... And because it has the sort of the rounded top, it f slides in pretty well. So um, because I ironed out all the Frixian markings, I've just marked around approximately where that is, and I'm going to close it up. And then we're going to move on to our bias strips for the top and the bottom of the corset. And I will be back to show you that. So we're binding the top and the bottom of the corset. Before uh, we apply our binding, we are pressing approximately an eighth of an inch down on one of the long raw edges of your binding. And you have enough, the pattern gives you enough binding, uh, but I would basically, I already know this is the correct width. I would start from the center and I would work my way out in terms of pinning this in place. But I, I just basically did this, I know it's correct. So we're going to just pin this in place and we're going to sew it with an eighth of an inch seam. And one thing I didn't mention, or maybe I did and I'm forgetting, is that when you uh, baste, make sure that you're basting within your eighth inch seam allowance because you don't really want that basting to show. You just want to make sure that it's hidden within that the seam. So I'm going to go all the way around and I'm not going to bore you with all this pinning, but again, sew, sewing this together with an eighth inch seam allowance. Make sure we have enough. Yeah, we have enough. And then we're going to look at our eyelets. And the eyelets are really probably the most, I wouldn't say hard. I don't think this is particularly hard. They're little small pieces. They're a little finicky. But I think that um, the eyelets are probably the most uh, time consuming because you have to do eight on either side. But the way that we're going to do them, they're very, very easy to do and very simple. Uh, they're just basically going to be a hole that you whip stitch around very tightly. And, you know, once you get the hang of it, it goes pretty quickly. So I was <laughs> remarking to myself earlier that this probably could stand up on its own and it can. Um, and that's what we want. We want it to be nice and stiff so it provides the proper support. We'll see you in a little bit. So the top of the corset's been bound, working on the bottom of the corset now, but I just want to show you how we're going to manage the lacing holes. And you know, I'm always talking about, or at least a lot of instructors talk about the Frixion pen. I think it's really kind of wonderful um, in terms of what it allows you to do in markings and then just being able to iron them out, um, which is really, really great. Um, so I'm marking the holes with a Frixion pen. I think this is like approximately, I don't know, about a little over an eighth, maybe three sixteenths away from the edge of the corset. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to match my sides up. Let's see here, make sure that we've got a a good alignment. And then I'm just going to mark the corresponding holes on the other side of the corset. Okay. Now I have this little tool that came in a not very expensive necessary that I bought. Um, it's basically, I think it's like an awl, probably used for this very purpose. And I love using it for eyelets because it just allows you to really get in there. And so basically, that's how we're gonna start the eyelet. I should have had my thread. Oh, I do have a thread that's already knotted. Starting from the back, you're basically just going to imagine you're sort of whipping around this hole. 
Well, you are whipping around it. You don't have to imagine it. You're whipping around it. If you have slightly heavier thread, you could always use that for this. But you're basically just whipping around the, the open edge and going in probably like about a sixteenth or even a little bit over a sixteenth. I think this is more than a sixteenth around that hole. You know, if you need for whatever reason to get a little bit more room to work in, you can just kind of re stretch it out. But really just very, very simple. Um, it's like a, you're overcasting. You know, you wouldn't want to do a buttonhole stitch here because it's going to be just too, too much bulk and it will close up the opening. But you just keep working that around. You could actually make all of your holes and then maybe do this while you're watching TV because it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Just a couple more stitches. And then what I like to do is just pass my thread to the back. You know, it's the, the back doesn't look great, but you're not gonna really see the back. You're gonna see the front. You just wanna make sure that it's strong. So pass my thread through the back and just pass it through a couple of stitches. No need to knot it off. This is a very tight. And then you've basically got your little eyelet. So I'm going to continue with the eyelets and the bottom, and then I'll come back and show you the finished corset. This is the corset as it's laced. Um, again, it's worn over her chemise and the chemise is worn under the pantalettes. Um, you're gonna see a little bit of wrinkles here. I think that in the, um, in the pattern and in the instructions, I've specified that this should be cut on the bias. You're gonna see a lot of her bodices are cut on the bias. This one was not, this was cut on the straight, um, but I don't think you're going to have these wrinkles once this is cut on the bias. You might have a little bit, but it'll be a much smoother fit. And the same thing with the front. These side panels will be cut on the bias and this front will be cut on the straight. So um, that is her corset and you're going to have some cord in your kit. Um, you're going to start lacing at the top and I recommend that you use a large eye or two large eye um, sort of cruel blunt tip or you know they can be sharp but the blunt tip uh, is probably best needles um, to thread this through and to lace it up the back because it's just these our holes are tiny and it's just going to be much easier for you if you've got something that you're using um, to help you so again um, this will be started here and then you know just try to be you know, you can lace it however you want, but just try to be consistent in terms of how you cross. So in this case, um, on the on her left hand side, it goes under on her right hand side, it goes over and it always comes up and goes out of the eyelet. Um, I'm sure that there are other ways of lacing, but this is the one I, I like um, the best. So uh, I hope that you enjoy the corset and um, Again, you can make it out of other materials if you want, um, but in this period, it actually sometimes also had um, straps that go over the shoulder. I think in this case, because a lot of her dresses are, um, and those straps might be held on by um, but buttons, uh, so they can be removable. But in this case, I think we just don't want, again, um, a lot on her shoulders because a lot of her dresses are low cut. I apologize if you hear some rattling in the background. That's, it's laundry day here today. So what we're doing now is we're working on the crinoline. 
and we have cut a piece of organdy, which is seven inches tall by 20 inches wide. And there will be a piece of tarlatan in your uh, kits that is actually already cut to size. And I believe that's about, uh, let me see, two by 20, approximately two by 20. So what you're going to do is you're going to iron down at least a quarter of an inch of the, one of the long edges of the tarlatan and then right sides together and there's really no right side to um, organdy, you're going to sew that to the bottom of the organdy piece with an eighth inch seam allowance. Then we're gonna press that. And basically we're doing this, there are several different ways of doing it, but we're going to be putting this flat and working with it flat because I think it's a little easier sometimes when you work with a skirt when it's actually still flat. So this is going to help us keep with that sort of stiff bell shape for her skirts. Um, at the time, hoops had not been invented yet. Those would come in probably in the, I would say, mid to late 50s, maybe a little earlier than that, but women had to resort to wearing many stiffened undergarments to try to hold their skirts out. And sometimes those were, um, those were cotton that had been heavily starched or they could have been corded, uh, meaning there was a, a cord that was run through um, a channel and that would provide some fullness. That was something a little bit earlier in the 40s, maybe late 30s, early 40s. And then you had um, what was called a crinoline. And crinoline, I believe, is actually horsehair. It's French for horsehair. I may be wrong about that. Maybe someone can correct me, but um, that's what I understand. And that um, they would put these bands of, of the stiffened material into these skirts so they would actually um, stand out from their, from their bodies. So what we're doing now is organdy is this, has this beautiful crisp quality. It's almost like it's heavily starched. Probably it is. We're adding this band to the bottom. And we're going to um, hem stitch this uh, all the way across and we have a nice crisp um, edge to it. And we're then going to seam it. We're going to seam it. And this is one of the few um, pieces of her wardrobe that uses a quarter inch seam allowance. You're gonna do a quarter of an inch, uh, approximately to about two and a half inches from the opening. Let's see here. I might wanna adjust that a little bit. Yeah, I would say actually maybe to two inches, and I'll change that in the instructions. Let me get this pen and just do a little marking here, the handy Frixion, if it will mark. Yeah. So once we've hemmed it um, all the way across, we're going to close up the seam with a quarter inch seam allowance. We're gonna stop at approximately two inches from the top. And just to show you, and I'll show you this in the next step, there's going to be a, um, there's going to be a waistband. And this is really going to, the waistband is sort of like a fitted waistband, and it's going to hang off of this waistband. It's gonna be very similar to how we did the uh, waistband for the pantalettes, um, a little bit similar to what we did for the chemise. So I'm going to um, step away, and I'm going to get this hemmed, and then I will come back and I will show you the start of the waistband. So we've closed up the back and we've left that two inches at the top. And then we've turned over under, we folded and turned under the seam allowance on both sides and we've hemmed that down with a little running stitch. Now what I'm doing is I am applying this great uh, material that the Carmel Doll Shop found. It's It really approximates that sort of woven um, horse hair. And I think, you know, maybe in the 50s, they might have used this. I um, mean, couture, I think they use it to give body to things. But um, this is a really great, uh, a great way to introduce some of that stiffening and some added layer of stiffening into this, um, into this crinoline. So what I'm doing is I just, 
I cut a 21 inch piece. I overlapped it at the center back. It's kind of thick, so you just wanna make sure that you're, you're pinning it carefully. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sew it around the skirt, or rather the crinoline, approximately, I don't know, maybe an eighth of an inch underneath that tarlatan strip on the inside of the crinoline. So what we're doing, if I can see clearly, I can thread a needle. And of course I can't see clearly enough. Ah, I got it. We're going to just run, we're just gonna sew that down in place with a little running stitch. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're gonna run two rows of gathering stitches along the top. Now, this is not gonna be cartridge pleated. This is just going to be gathered and it's going to be gathered into that sort of drop waistband that we were looking at earlier. And I will show you the simplicity of that. It's basically a front piece and then fitted a fitted back piece. And it's going to be made up out of three, each one of these, the outside is gonna be made up of three pieces, uh, one side piece, another side piece, and the front. And then we're going to do the same thing that we did with both the um, pantalette waistband and the chemise um, yoke, we're going to basically be creating um, a lined uh, aligned waistband. And I'll show you how to do that. And let me get going on this and I will be back and show you the next step with the waistband. So we've prepared the waistband for the crinoline very much like we did the waistband for the pantalettes. Um, we've joined the pieces we right sides together, we've seamed them across the top. Uh, before we've done that, we've turned back an eighth of an inch on the short ends and about three sixteenths on the long end or long edge of the inside of the waistband. So the unfolded piece is going to be your uh, outer waistband. So I haven't actually um, finished gathering. I have my second row of gathering stitches to do, but I just wanted to show you. We are going to find the center of this, and we're gonna find the center of our outer waistband. Do it this way. Yeah, this way's better, okay. Find the center of our outer waistband. And we're going to mark that, mark that with a friction, with a pen, whatever you want to do. And then we're going to match them. And we're also going to, let me just pretend I'm going to do this now. And then we're going to match the ends, each end, with the finished edge or uh, opening of the crinoline and then we're going to basically pull it up the gathers to fit and again what I like to do is once I've got the gathers where I want them to be in they're sort of evenly distributed I like to just give a little bit of a press gentle press to the top of those gathers just so they lay flat it makes it much easier to sew the seam so I'm going to do that and I will be back and show you the tape for the waistband or our channel for the waistband and how we finish that. So the waistband has been attached. Uh, again, very similar to the pantalette. Um, we've sewn the front down we've kept the back loose and then we have slip stitched the back to the um, crinoline. And then we've actually run just a little bit of a running stitch um, about a sixteenth of an inch above that seam. And then we've uh, closed up the ends, leaving open approximately a quarter of an inch at the top for the channel. And then we have um, created a channel by top stitching across the entire um, uh, top of the waistband and we've slip stitched the other side closed, again leaving that side open. So now we're going to take a, a very blunt needle, like a cruel needle, and we're going to carefully feed it through that little channel. And you know, you might have a bodkin or something else you use for this, but it's kind of a small opening. Um, and I think you're probably gonna want to um, have a little bit more space. So a needle does very well. It just needs to be blunt. So it doesn't go through the fabric. You may have to tug it a little bit, but that's okay. 
I'll just keep. And if it doesn't, you can always pull it out and see where the hang up is because I think it might be here. I may be right about that. Yes, I think I am. Okay. Well, you might have to just keep working it until you actually can get it through. It's not going to really be that much of a uh, of a of trouble. So just keep persevering, and you'll get it through. And then I think, um, you know, if you really, really want um, this to be easier, you might even use just like a piece of um, a piece of cord or something that you have, like string or something else that will pass through those side seams a little bit easier. So I'm going to continue to do that. Um, but before, oh, there we go. Here, yeah, success, see? Um, before I move on to the, the, um, finishing this, let me just set this aside. I just want to say that, um, you know, these crinolines were very utilitarian. Uh, they probably were not decorated, but it doesn't mean that we can't add a little bit of color if we want. Um, they probably were almost never washed either uh, because of the stiffening. So what I've done on the other crinoline is, see, that pulled through quite nicely. And you're just going to want to knot those, those threads off. See, it's sort of creating that, it stands on its own, <laughs> creating that bell shape that we want. Um, you might want to knot the ends of these just to keep them from falling through, but I don't think... Again, that's really necessary. Uh, the other crinoline sample that I made actually has some feather stitching around the hem. And this would be something that, you know, would be very, there might be white work, there might be something in color. Again, since this wasn't washed, probably it was, they would use a color like red. Uh, red was very popular um, on under things. So you could do a feather stitch. Um, I'm going to leave some instructions uh, for feather stitches, or you can do um, herringbone. You can do, you know, any other type of decorative stitch that you do like. So I'm going to put that aside. I'm going to knot this off, and then we're going to try this on Adelina, again, it did not need to be fitted to her waist because it's a drawstring. So I think we're pretty much, besides the embroidery, if we choose to do it, we're pretty much done with this garment. In order to make the pantalettes and the petticoat, you're going to pre-tuck two panels of fabric. Now, um, when you're working with your fabric, you want to establish where the grain is or what the direction of the grain is. So I generally do that by pulling a thread. I don't know if you can see that, this sort of dark line here is where I've pulled a thread. The other line is the cut line. So you don't want to you know, start your tucks, which are supposed to be parallel with something which is uneven. So you're gonna find that, that straight grain and then I'm just going to cut on that grain, and that's going to be the line that we start everything from. Okay. So what you're gonna to wanna to do, and again, you can do this by pulling threads. Um, I have tried with this fabric to pull threads, and I wasn't really happy with how the threads were pulling. Um, I just feel like it was a little onerous, and the fiber length, it's just like, breaking and I just wasn't happy with it and I don't want you to struggle with it. So, you know, why not use your friction and just measure and you just need to make sure you measure carefully. So you're going to measure up from the bottom of your fabric two inches. And then to make things really simple, you're going to draw a straight line. You're going to have to do this across your entire fabric. And it's okay because you've got your straight and you've got your straight, you always know you're going to be um, parallel. And then you're going to mark another mark above that mark. And that mark is going to be your sewing line. So the first line is your stitch line. The second line is, I mean, sorry, the first line is your fold line and the second line is your stitching line. Okay, so you've got those two lines you're going to fold your fabric on that first line, that fold line, and you're going to pin it. You know, you're just really 
pinning it just to keep it even and front, stop it from shifting. And um, one thing that I you can also do if you want is you can start your fabric before you start sewing with it because it will give you um, these really crisp uh, folded edges, which are always so much nicer to work with. And I haven't knotted this, but I'm just going to show you really quickly. I'm just going to do a really quick running stitch. Now you want to do this with small stitches, small even stitches. These stitches above the fold are the ones that are going to show. So, you know, you're going to want to do nice work here, just like small even running stitches. And again, we're using that Frixion line as our sewing line. all the way across, get rid of these pins. I'm gonna go all the way across. I should have made this a little narrower. And the piece that I'm, I'm working on is not, it's just a sample piece to show you. It's not any particular size. The sizes will be provided in your instructions for cutting. Most important thing is for you just to maintain the straight of the grain, or start from there at least. Okay, so you've done your first line of stitching and obviously you're going to, for the petticoat, you're gonna be going all the way across and for the pendulets, you're gonna be going all the way across. So that is your first tuck. So what I like to do as I'm working is I like to iron as I go because then you always have just like a nice clean finished, edge to work from. So that's your first tuck. Now, from the folded edge of your first tuck, you're going to measure up five eighths of an inch. And this is exactly the same thing that we, we've done with the first tuck, but we're, the dimensions are gonna be a little bit different for these next two. So I'm going to draw the straight line. I know that sewing machines actually have these built-in tucking um, tucking mechanisms and, and feet that you can put on. And I, I just like to do them by hand, but I know that they do beautiful tucks. And again, this is your project. So if you want to use the machine, you should use the machine. But in the 1840s, although they probably would have loved to have had them, they did not have sewing machines yet. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to be folding it. And I'm just going to really mark it with a pin. Sort of approximate that stitch line. And that's your second tuck. Imagine that that's sewn together. So from that tuck, you're going to measure up from the folded edge you're going to measure up another five eighths and you're going to repeat that and then you're going to measure your eighth inch for your stitching line and that's going to give you your three tucks so i'm just going to show you sort of what that looks like on the finished uh, on the finished piece you have not hemmed anything yet and the reason why we're not hemming anything is that you're going to use this panel for your petticoat and you're going to you're going to hem the bottom of this for your petticoat. For your pantalettes, it's gonna have a slightly different hem length and your pattern will show you where to start, where the tucks are, um, but you're basically going to be using your pattern piece on top of your pre-tucked fabric to cut out your pantalettes. And when, when that panel's done, I will show you how to do that. Um, very, very simple. So you're, again, you're gonna be preparing two pieces of tucked fabric. If you really wanted to, you could do it as one long piece. Just add those two widths together. They're probably they're going to be the same height um, uh, in terms of the fabric. Uh, and then, you know, you don't have to be working with two different pieces of fabric. But I just think, you know, the petticoat's quite wide. I believe it's about 22 inches. That's a, that's a lot to be measuring. But if you do it carefully and slowly, you will not have any issues. So we'll be back when those panels have been, at least for the pantalettes, have been tucked and they're ready to cut. We've prepared our tucked uh, piece for the pantalettes 
and basically it was using that technique of measuring, um, not pulled threads. I have to say I probably prefer a pulled thread technique, but as I said with this fabric, it's not, it was not behaving. So I'm going to place our pattern piece. Now we need a left side and we need a right side to this pattern. So when we do this, we're going to get a mirror image. I've also determined where I want my hem to be. So I have started, and I probably will mark this on the pattern, I've, I've placed the first, um, first row of tucks or the bottom of the first row of tucks where I want them to be. And I think that looks good. You know, when we're putting this together, you're just going to make sure you're aligning your, your tucks. Let's just get it to be where we want it to be first. I'm not going to cut the bottom of this yet because I'd like to establish the hem first. I guess I can cut it. I'm going to cut it. I like to change my mind. So let's just, <laughs> let's just cut this off. Hopefully that wasn't a mistake because I don't want to have to do another one of those panels. There we go. So you've got a matched pair. And I think, I think this is perfect. I'm going to turn up the hem by a quarter of an inch. And then I'm going to turn it up again. And that looks like it's better by a half inch. Yep, that's a half inch. There we go. Now I'm going to hem that down. And there's something that we're going to do to finish the, the edge of the, or the end of the, the pantalette. Uh, the leg opening, but we're going to do that afterwards. I think um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to spray starch this just to give it a little bit more body because what we're going to do is we're going to turn two really narrow hems and make sure you've got a, a left and a right side. We're going to make two very narrow hems on the openings. These are going to be left open, but they're going to be hemmed. And that was really just for convenience in the 19th century. Um, so let's, uh, let's give this a little starch and I will come back and show you the progress on the hemming. So we've whipped lace onto the bottom of the pantalettes and we have um, pressed that. And now we're going to French seam the leg opening. So each one of these, remember, is a separate piece. We're going to French seam the leg opening open, and then we're going to gather the top and run, just really run a gathering stitch and then set it aside, leave a, leave a thread long. I just want to show you also that, that sort of that narrow hem at the front and the back. 
and I'm going to show you what that looks like finished. So we're going to move on to the waistband after that. You're going to do the same procedure for, remember you have a, a right and a left hand side for your pantalettes. Then we're going to move on to the waistband and the waistband is very simple. It's basically, you're going to cut four pieces. You're going to have a front opening and you're going to have a back seam. And we're going to do this very much like we did the chemise. You're going to be actually sewing this together and then sewing it to get back to back or rather right sides to right sides and turning it inside out. And I'll show you how we do that when we get to it. But um, and one thing just also to point out is that all of these sort of under things with closures at the waist are going to have um, different uh, closure placement. So in this case, the closure is in the front. In the case of the petticoat, it's in the it's a drawstring, or rather, it's a waistband and uh, it's in the back. And in the um, crinoline, it's going to be a um, a cotton tape tie that will also be in the back because we just don't want all of those things to pile up on top top of one another and, and become bulky. So I'm going to go away and do the and do the French seaming. And then when we're ready to do the waistband, I will come back and show you that progress. This is the waistband for the pantalettes. It's, you're gonna, as I said before, I think, you're gonna cut uh, four of these, uh, four identical. And you're basically going to seam them together at the back, uh, both the, the front and the back of the, or rather the lining of the waistband. And then on both pieces, you're going to uh, press back an eighth of an inch of seam allowance on both of the short ends. And then only on the lining, when you, you know, they're identical right now, but you determine which one's going to be your lining, you're going to press back um, an eighth of an inch along the bottom edge. So what you're going to do now is you're going to sew these together along the top only, not on the sides, just along the top. And then when we've done that, we are going to come back and I'm going to show you how we actually will attach this to the waistband. And the way it's going to work is that we're going to pull up the fullness, the gathering, from the front. We're going to align our fronts and we're going to pull up our gathering so the back opening is exactly aligned with the center of the back seam. So I'm going to stitch this up and come back and I'll do perhaps put one leg in and just show you how that's going to look uh, before we sew it together. So we have gathered and sewn each leg to the waistband, to the waistband front. And as, as we did that, we were very careful not to sew through the lining because what we're going to do now, we've pressed up the seam allowance into the waistband, we're going to basically fold this over and sandwich the seam in between it. And I'm probably just going to do that with a little slip stitch. But basically that is your, once you've done that and you've given it a good press, this is your front opening, those are your pantalettes. And I want to show you the closure. We're going to do two small buttons. This is when you actually have to try it on your doll. We're gonna do two small buttons after you've put it on your doll and determine what the closure is going to be. And then we're gonna do two thread loops. So you see she's got quite a small little waist here. Um, I think that, uh, that about sums it up for the pantalettes. I hope that um, you find them easy to put together. They, it does take a little bit of time, but it's really not very, um, they're not very hard at all. And you get these really pretty little under things for her. So we took our pre-tucked panel with a petticoat and we turned the hem in a quarter of an inch and we turned it over another three quarters of an inch and you, yours may end up like this, but the lowest tuck actually hides that hem stitching. So just make sure that when you're hemming, since you've already pre-tucked, that if that is the case, that you move that top 
um, that rather the bottom pleat out of your way as you're hemming because you don't want to stitch through it. And then we've uh, whipped on our cotton lace to the hem. And then with a quarter inch seam allowance and matching our, our tucks, we've sewn this together approximately about two inches. Um, we've stopped two inches above the, uh, or below the, the waistline. And we've turned under our seam allowances and we're just slip stitching those in place. So our next step will be to run two rows of gathering stitches within our seam allowance at the top of the, on the raw edge. And then we're not cartridge pleating this, we're just gathering it up like we did with the petticoat and with the, the crinoline. And then we're gonna take our waistband and we're going to iron down a, approximately an eighth of an inch on one side. And this does not look even to me, so I'm gonna just iron that out. We're gonna iron down an eighth of an inch on one long side, one long edge. Yeah, that's, that's better. And then you do want to fit this to your doll. This should fit your doll's waist because I think these dolls are very consistent. But what you want to do is make sure that you find your center and then find your two, um, your two sides and basically then quarter your skirt. So you're going to, I I can get the needle out of here. You're going to um, match your backs once you've got this the gathering stitch is done. You're going to match your backs and you're going to leave approximately a quarter of an inch on uh, overhang because what you're going to do is once that's gathered and you've sewn it together, you're going to turn this under to kneading it and then we're going to bring it over and under and we're going to slip stitch it in place. So I'll show you on the doll what that looks like. A very simple waistband, very simple closure. And this actually also shows you the the corset backing, uh, the corset lacing, and I'm going to just open this up if I can get this up out, rather. Let's see here. Her clothes are rather tight fitting. You might want to make your thread loops a little larger than mine, but I don't really intend that this is going to come off that often. Okay, my fingers are a little clumsy this morning. And then we're going to undo the crinoline, and then you can see how that laces up the back. Um, you see these little wrinkles here? You're not going to have that issue because I have changed the, the specification of the pattern to have these side panels and the front side panels cut on the bias. So there's going to be a little bit more give there and probably a little bit more of a form fitting um, form fitting to her actual waist rather than having these wrinkles. So that is the, our last undergarment for her. And I hope that you've enjoyed this. Again, um, in this period, women wore multiple petticoats, uh, probably sometimes like three or four of um, different fabrics and different levels of starching um, in order to keep their skirts out. I think with this project, I'm really only recommending that we do the crinoline and one petticoat because it would just be too much, um, make her waist a little too thick. And this is the era of the very thin, long, elongated um, bodice and thin waist. So we're going to leave it to one petticoat. But if you want to do multiple ones, you know, have fun. You can do some different options. Um, I think that uh, they can be different lengths. Uh, and, you know, maybe one doesn't have tucks, one has tucks, one has another type of lace, uh, maybe one has white work, um, but it's a very simple pattern. You can make as many as you want. So I will, um, I'll finish this up and I hope that you've enjoyed this tutorial. Uh, as always, it's been a lot of fun for me to, um, work with you. Thank you. <music>